Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Nursi Chair in Islamic Studies at John Carroll University, it's my honor to welcome you all here tonight and to introduce our speaker for this evening, Father Michael Calabria. Father Michael Calabria is a Franciscan friar of Holy Name Province. He has more than 30 years of experience in the Middle East and the Islamic world. He has degrees from Johns Hopkins, Brown, and Columbia. After working as an academic librarian in New York City, he entered the Franciscan Order in 1996 and studied at Washington Theological Union. As a friar, he lived in Cairo in 2001-2002, ministering in a leprosarium, and between 2003 and 2011, he spent many, uh, many summers in Egypt teaching English at the Catholic Catholic Seminary in Cairo. Father Michael began teaching at St. Bonaventure University in 2003. After initiating the program in Arabic, he developed and taught a variety of courses in Islamic studies that comprised a minor in Arabic and Islamic studies. He left St. Bonaventure in 2012 in order to complete his PhD in Islamic studies with the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter. During this time, he served as a chaplain at Georgetown University, where he was active in the programs of the El Walid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and the Center for Contemporary Arabic Studies. In April 2015, he successfully defended his dissertation on Egyptians in the Quran, Islamic exegesis and extra canonical texts. Father Michael has traveled extensively in the Islamic world and has visited and conducted research in Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Oman, Turkey, and India. He speaks widely on various aspects of Islam and Islamic culture, including the Quran, Islamic spirituality, art and ar architecture, and Christian-Muslim relations. Please join me in welcoming Father Michael Calabria. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you. It's good to be with you. Thank you, Dr. Zeki. Twice annually in October and April, over the course of several days, the auction houses of Christie's and Sotheby's hold auctions of Islamic art, when superb examples of carpets, paintings, manuscripts, and objets d'art may be procured if you're willing to pay the price. In past years, a bronze Fatimid gazelle from the 10th or 11th century sold at Christie's for $1.5 million. An inlaid brass Mamelu candlestick from the 14th century sold at Sotheby's for nearly $7.4 million dollars. And in what must be a record breaker, in 2013, a 17th century Persian carpet, it's only about nine feet by six and a half feet wide, sold for a record $33.7 million. But what is Islamic art really worth? In the last decade, several major museums around the world have made significant investments in Islamic art, not only by actively building their collections, but also with extensive and costly renovations of their galleries of Islamic art. These include New York's Metropolitan Museum in 2011, the Louvre in 2012, and Istanbul's Museum of Turkish and Islamic Art 2013 to 2015. In Cairo, the Museum of Islamic Art underwent a complete renovation, opening in 2010, 
and then again in 2015 after being badly damaged from a bomb blast across the street. New museums entirely devoted to Islamic art opened in Doha, Qatar in 2009 and in Toronto, Canada in 2014. Moreover, special exhibitions highlighting particular areas of Islamic art run concurrently throughout the year and throughout the world. Exhibits of Islamic art since only the summer of 2016 in North America alone include Court and Cosmos, the Great Age of the Seljuks, Seljuks at the Metropolitan in New York. Art and stories from Mughal India, from here in Cleveland, at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Animals in Islamic art at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. Islamic art from the As-Sabah collection at Houston's Museum of Fine Arts. And the art of the Quran at the Freer and Sackler in Washington. And to this list, we can also add Jerusalem 1000 to 1400 at the Met which featured a considerable amount of Islamic art along with Christian and Jewish artifacts. Thus, even as portions of the American and European electorates continue to gorge themselves on Islamophobic rhetoric of presidents and politicians, it seems that many others are hungering for Islamic art. And it is indeed a rich fare. A sumptuous feast for the eyes of calligraphy and painting, of carpets and textiles, ceramics, glass, stone, tile, metalwork, and woodwork. Beyond the aesthetics and opulence of such masterworks, beyond the auction house prices and museum ticket prices, is a greater value, however. Islamic art and architecture presents, in my view, the most eloquent and most elegant response to those who are attempting to homogenize Islam. Fundamentalists, radicals, reactionaries, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, who paint Islam and Islamic societies in a monochromatic tone of intolerant orthodoxy and puritanical orthopraxis. In an attempt to purge Islamic history of its dazzling and diverse polychromatic past, groups such as ISIS are actively engaged in the destruction of Islamic sites and shrines that do not fit their myopic view of Islam. While international attention continues to focus on the destruction of pre-Islamic antiquities, the majority of the sites that are being destroyed in Syria and Iraq are from the Islamic era, including mosques, tombs, tombs of prophets, saints, and renowned scholars. Sufi and Shiite shrines and their visitors have come under attack in Syria, Iraq, Pakistan, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Somalia, and Mali. Then there is the officially sanctioned destruction of early Islamic sites in and around Mecca and Medina by the Saudi regime. Dehistoricizing and decontextualizing Islam such that Muslims are, in the words of Shahab Ahmed, taken back to quote the year zero of the Wahhabi present. So here we have a 19th century photograph, and this is what the same terrain looks like today. In my presentation this evening, I hope to demonstrate that Islamic art and architecture are without question essential to correcting a simplistic and ahistorical view of Islam and the Islamic world that has been promulgated by the likes of ISIS and Al-Qaeda Wahhabi-inspired clerics, Christian fundamentalists, politicians, and pundits of every stripe. I hope also to demonstrate that Islamic art and architecture, like the art of other cultures and faiths, are crucial to understanding the entire world as we know it, a world that cannot 
and must not be dichotomized into cultural and confessional camps, but rather a world in which ethnic, political, and religious communities are uniquely woven together from many cultural and confessional strands and in which the best of human culture and creativity results from sharing ideas, beliefs, materials, techniques, and technologies. Before I get into the substance of my presentation, it's necessary to acknowledge the many problems associated with the term Islamic art. We use it all the time, but in fact there's a considerable amount of debate whether it's indeed a valid term at all. Because unlike other art historical categories such as Byzantine or Romanesque art, the term Islamic art is chronologically open-ended and can, can uh, refer to anything made after the advent of Islam in the 7th century of the current era to the present. Also, unlike other art historical categories, Islamic art is geographically, culturally, and ethnically vague, typically referring to art associated with peoples, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, from the Iberian Peninsula, from North Africa and the Middle East, to Anatolia, Central, South, and Southeast Asia. Given the inexactness of the term, museums have struggled what to call their newly renovated galleries or new galleries in light of contemporary scholarship. Thus, in recognition of the regional character of Islamic art, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, for example, calls their galleries art of the Arab lands, Turkey, Iran, Central Asia, and South Asia. It doesn't exactly roll trippingly off the tongue. Yet recognizing that a certain degree of cohesion transcends regional differences, the Met continues to refer to its curatorial unit as the Department of Islamic Art. So there's this struggle what to actually call this artwork that comes from such a diversity of cultures and areas. However, Scholars continue to use the term Islamic art, and I will use it for the purpose of my presentation this evening. It is customary in many introductory books and courses on Islam to begin with the so-called five pillars, the arkan, the essential practices of the Islamic faith. That is the profession of faith, shahada, ritual prayer, salat, almsgiving, zakat, Fasting during Ramadan, Saum, and the pilgrimage to Mecca, Hajj. My purpose this evening is to use works of art and architecture that relate to the five pillars in order to demonstrate that although Muslims in all ages and all lands have performed and continue to perform these acts with relative uniformity, Islamic art and architecture exemplifies the geographical, ethnic, cultural, and gender diversity of the Muslims performing them. I suggest it is precisely that diversity that makes Islamic art invaluable in contemporary education and a necessity for realizing a more accurate view of Islam as expressed historically and geographically. The profession of faith, the shahada, la ilaha illallah wa muhammadan rasulullah. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. This is the essential message of Islam. As such, the Muslim profession of faith is ubiquitous in Islamic art and architecture, appearing at the entrances to mosques and palaces, and on numerous objets d'art, such as lamps, tiles, tombstones, tomb covers, and coins. Take, for example, this gold 100 mohair piece from the reign of Shah Jahan, who ruled the Mughal Empire in South Asia from 1628 to 1658, best known as the builder of the Taj Mahal. His patrilineal line was tra traced back to the Mongol Genghis Khan, 
and the Turkic conqueror Timur. He was born of a Hindu mother, however, as was his father. He was Sunni Muslim, but his wife came from a Persian Shiite family. His forefathers spoke Chagatay Turkish, but he spoke, read, and wrote in Persian, and also knew Hindi, his mother's language. Yet, he performed Salat, prayer, in Arabic, the language of the Qur'an and the faith he professed, a language that bound him to Muslim believers, reaching from Morocco to Mecca and to the Moluccas. Yet, his coins proclaimed the Shahada in Arabic to his subjects, who were largely Hindu, but also comprised Jains, Sikhs, Zoroastrians, Parsis, Jews, and Christians, as well as Muslims, Sunni, Shia, Sufi. Shah Jahan believed in one God, but he ruled a people who largely saw and conceived of divinity manifested in a myriad of forms. Moreover, in spite of his Muslim faith and the problems he experienced from the intrusive Portuguese merchants and military, he did not object to Western Christian symbolism being used in a painting where he is depicted with his father-in-law, blessed by an anthropomorphic god, perched among the clouds, who sends the Holy Spirit upon the emperor in the form of a dove and tongues of fire. Moreover, although Shah Jahan professed Islam and word and deed, and is often characterized as more quote-unquote orthodox than his predecessors, he nevertheless partook of wine on occasion, as evidenced by his wine cup now in London's Victoria and Albert Museum. There's a second wine cup with Shah Jahan's name in the British Museum. Not unlike Shah Jahan, this nephrite jade cup bears several cultural influences. The use of a gourd form for the body of the cup is Chinese in inspiration, while the lotus petals and sensitivity of the animal portraiture are characteristic of Hindu art. The ideas of the pedestal support and the use of the acanthus leaves are European in origin. And while we may be tempted to dismiss Shah Jahan's occasional taste for wine as evidence of Mughal heterodoxy, consumption of wine was hardly unusual in Islamic societies, Sunni and Shia, as evidenced by wine cups and bowls such as these from Seljuk, Iran as well as by the numerous representations of people serving or sipping wine, by Muslim treatises on drinking, and the numerous literary references to drinking, which cannot all be metaphorical. Even as Shah Jahan professed the one omnipotent God, he nevertheless believed in the power of the planets to affect human affairs, and thus continued the practice of employing a Brahmin royal astrologer, a position instituted by his grandfather Akbar. In fact, Shah Jahan may have had two royal astrologers, whose job it was to cast the birth charts of members of the royal family to select favorable moments to undertake important tasks. In this painting from Shah Jahan's reign, we see a bearded astrologer and his assistant to the right, accompanied by an ascetic and a Sufi ecstatic. Again, we might be tempted to attribute Shah Jahan's stargazing as personal heterodoxy, but there are numerous examples of fine artwork from Islamic lands on paper, in ceramic and metalwork, that attest to the widespread belief in the power of the stars. Clearly, Shah Jahan's formal and public declaration of the Shahada in 17th century South Asia did not require that he denigrate non-Muslim faiths or reject non-Muslim religious symbolism and artistic elements 
nor did it require him to maintain a narrow understanding of Sharia. Islamic law requires that those who engage in prayer be in a state of ritual purity. This is accomplished by performing ablutions, wudu. This 16th century porcelain basin from Ming, China was used just for that purpose, as evidenced by the inscriptions. Although perhaps made for a Chinese Muslim member of the emperor's court in the 16th century, the central decoration is the Arabic word taharat, purity. The blue decoration on a white background for which Ming China was well known is not of Chinese origin, however. Although Muslims in the Middle East admired and attempted to imitate the fine white porcelains of Tang China, it was Muslim ceramicists of the early 9th century, probably from Basra, Iraq, that initiated the use of blue decoration on ceramic surfaces using cobalt oxide mined in Iran. In order to capture the Middle Eastern market for blue on white ceramics, Tang Chinese potters imitated this decoration on ceramic exports. Although the blue on white decoration was not popular in Tang China, it later became the hallmark of Chinese ceramics during the Yuan and Ming dynasties. Yet even in these later periods, the cobalt used for the very distinctive blue was still largely imported from Iran, near Kashan. The Chinese actually refer to the precious blue material as Mohammedan blue. This Ming canteen served as a particularly good example of cross-cultural influences between the Islamic world and East Asia. The outer decorative border features a Chinese wave design, but the floral arabesque decoration in the wider band is Islamic in inspiration, as perhaps also is the eight-pointed star in the middle. Moreover, the shape of the Chinese canteen itself is derived from metal and ceramic examples from Islamic lands. Due to their far-reaching commercial activities, Muslims used and developed directional and navigational devices, such as the astrolabe, to determine the position of the stars and sun relative to the ground. Devices like the astrolabe allowed Muslims to pray at the proper time and in the proper direction no matter where they were in the world. Although the astrolabe was invented in Hellenistic times, and used by the Byzantines, those produced in the Islamic world were of exceptional craftsmanship. In this 14th century astrolabe, the multicultural and multi-confessional society of Islamic Spain, Al-Andalus, is strikingly apparent as ever by its multilingual inscriptions. When first made, the astrolabe was inscribed in Latin and Arabic, reflecting its intended use by Christians and Muslims. Later, Hebrew words were scratched on, indicating use by a Jew, a member of the third religious community comprising Andalusian society. A century later, that learned, cultured, and opulent world of Muslims, Christians, and Jews of Andalusia would come to an end when Isabella and Ferdinand expelled first Jews and then Muslims from their Catholic kingdom. Although Muslims are not required to perform obligatory prayers in a mosque, the place where one prays must be clean, and thus prayers are often performed on carpets specifically designed for this purpose. While some carpets utilize geometric design to indicate Qibla, direction, others, such as this 15th century Ottoman example, probably from Istanbul, uses architectural elements. 
The tripled art structure with a hanging lamp in the central portal and clumps of flowers at the bases is meant to evoke a gateway with a garden beyond, the paradise that awaits the righteous one who is attentive to prayer. This carpet presents yet another example of multiculturalism and religious pluralism from the Islamic world. While the floral pale blue border is Ottoman in inscription, as is the row of small dome structures above the parapet, the weaving technique and the dyes are more indicative of Cairo than they are of Istanbul. Moreover, the slender double columns that support the arches are characteristic of architecture in Muslim Spain and date to the period before the expulsion of Jews in 1492. It has thus been suggested that these motifs may have migrated from Spain to Istanbul via artifacts that accompanied refugee Sephardic Jews who were invited by the Ottoman Emperor Bayezid II to settle in his realm. As Walter Denny has concluded, the carpet is ultimately a paradox, a quintessentially Ottoman creation that synthesizes artistic elements from Egypt, Spain, and the Ottoman capital. That Jews sought refuge in Muslim realms is noteworthy, but hardly surprising. The Quran, of course, speaks of the essential connections between the monotheistic Abrahamic faiths. In fact, it was the Ottoman Emperor Suleiman I who provided Jews a space for prayer in Jerusalem at the western wall of the temple platform. Other objects from collections of Islamic art are more directly connected to Jewish communities in Islamic lands. Such as this wine vessel from Tbilisi, Georgia, dated to the late 12th or early 13th century. Although the inscription is in Hebrew, its decoration is derived from Central Asian Seljuk metalwork. Congregational mosques are, of course, the principal place for gathering the Muslim community in prayer, particularly for Friday Jumma or noonday prayer. A classic example of mosques in the Middle East is provided by Cairo's Mosque of Ibn Tulum. It was constructed between 876 and 879 by Ahmed Ibn Tulum, a Central Asian Turk who was born and raised in Samarra, Iraq, and served as the governor of Egypt, then part of the Abbasid Caliphate. It remains one of Cairo's largest and best known historical mosques. Yet authors often fail to mention that according to a 10th century biography of Ibn Tulum, the mosque's architect was a Christian, known simply as Al-Nasrani, the Christian, who was possibly from Samarra, like Ibn Tulum. Of course, Egypt, like most lands in the Islamic East, had an indigenous population of Christians whose artistic expression did not wane under Islamic rule, but in fact thrived even during the period of the Crusades, as evidenced by these ceramic fragments. The fragment on the left, now in Cairo, is part of a plate or patent used for liturgical purposes and is dated to either late Ayyubid or early Mamluk Egypt or Syria. Like the other objects we've been looking at, it exemplifies the multicultural milieu of its Islamic Middle Eastern context. Although the composition is clearly Byzantine inspired, representing the removal of Jesus' body from the cross, Mary's rounded face and almond-shaped eyes under arched eyebrows betray Central Asian influences. In the adjoining fragments, now in Athens, those Eastern influences are even more apparent. The cloud scrolls at the top 
are Chinese in inspiration. The white leaves interspersed between the figures is Ilkhanid in design. And the three dot pattern on the mantle of one of the women is the Chintamani, a design derived ultimately from Central Asian Buddhism and found on Seljuk ceramics from Iran. While the Roman Catholic Church struggled with the idea of enculturation in the modern period, Eastern Christians in Islamic lands have been doing it for centuries. Perhaps inspired by Abbasid mosques in Samarra, the Christian architect of Ibn Tulum's mosque utilized gently pointed arches used here for the first time in Egypt and one of the earliest examples in all of Islamic architecture. It has now been fairly well documented that from the Islamic Middle East and North Africa, the use of the pointed arch spread to southern Italy. And from southern Italy, it spread northwards into France and became the foundational element of the Gothic style, first in the Abbey of Cluny, then in the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis. Thus, a Christian architect from Iraq building a mosque in Egypt for his Muslim patron, utilizing an Islamic architectural element, unwittingly contribute to the transformation of Christian architecture in Europe in the 12th century. That's multiculturalism. The third pillar of Islam requires that alms be given to the poor. The word zakat means to purify, and thus suggests that the wealth one retains is purified by the act of charity. In the Qur'an, zakat is almost always mentioned in connection with prayer, indicating that one's relationship with God must find expression in care for societies vulnerable. Like Christianity, Islam produced holy men and women who undertook a life of voluntary poverty and itinerancy in order to gain spiritual riches. These dervishes met their physical needs by collecting alms and like their Christian counterparts, utilized a begging bowl or in Persian kashkul. This rather elaborate example from 16th century Iran was certainly not for an itinerant beggar but would have hung in a Sufi lodge, perhaps to hold the alms offered by benefactors. The form of the kashkul is derived from pre-Islamic wine boats of Iranian traditions, but the scrolling vines and arabesque medallions that decorate the body of the vessel connect it to Islamic lands further to the west. With its snarling dragon heads, it also demonstrates its influences from the Far East. The earliest examples of kashkuls come from the 14th century, an era when both Muslim and Christian mystics shunned wealth, power, and prestige, becoming poor ones, stripping themselves of base thoughts, actions, and desires, and directing their hearts, minds, and bodies to the remembrance of God, God who was reflected in everyone and everything. The Kashkul is thus a reminder that when Muslim dervishes wandered the Islamic world, supported by the zakat of the faithful, so too Christian mendicants, Franciscans, Dominicans, and Augustinians also begged for alms in Europe. Jesuits don't beg. That's a joke. So, fasting during the month of Ramadan constitutes the fourth pillar of Islam. The beginning of the month is determined by the sighting of the new moon. One of the most prominent Muslim scientists to study the phases of the moon was the scholar Abu Rahan Muhammad ibn Ahmed al-Biruni. In addition to his important and original works on astronomy and other areas of science, 
Al-Baruni is also known as a pioneer in comparative religion. Deeply interested in the works of Indian astronomers and mathematicians, he spent 13 years in India investigating not only the science, sciences, but making a detailed study of Hinduism, which he compares and contrasts with ancient Greek philosophy, Judaism, Christianity, and Zoroastrianism in an attempt to present an impartial description of theological and philosophical doctrines. When he notes errors or abuses among adherents of other religions, he also mentions that those occur with some Muslims. He often dismisses stereotypes and rumors and allows the sacred texts and traditions of other religions to speak for, himself, for themselves. He quotes extensively from a variety of Hindu scriptures, Greek philosophical authors, including Plato, Proclus, Aristotle, and Ammonius, as well as from the Torah and the New Testament, so that his readers might draw their own conclusions. Even as he noted differences, he looked for beliefs and practices held in common with Islam, such as almsgiving, fasting, and pilgrimage. In other words, Al-Biruni could be considered the father of interreligious studies and dialogue. Some 500 years after Al-Biruni studied Hindu texts in Sanskrit, in the 16th century, the Mughal emperor Akbar had texts such as the Ramayana translated into Persian and lavishly illustrated. His son Jahangir sought spiritual counsel from Hindu ascetics and commissioned several texts on yoga. These explaining its postures and its benefits. Darashiko, Jahangir's grandson, translated the Bhagavad Gita and Upanishads into Persian with the conviction that Islam and Hinduism possessed a common mystical language. Hajj, the fifth pillar of Islam, the pilgrimage to Mecca, considered the pinnacle of Muslim worship. To make the Hajj is to walk in the footsteps of the prophet Abraham and to run in the footsteps of Abraham's wife, Hagar. This Hajj certificate was made for a woman named Maimuna, who made the pilgrimage to Mecca, represented by the Kaaba, in 1433 of the current era, and then visited the tomb of the Prophet Muhammad in Medina, pictured in the lower portion of the scroll. Muslim women have not only been participants in the Hajj, however, but have been involved in all aspects of planning the journey. In the Mughal court during the reign of Akbar, the emperor's paternal aunt, Gulbadan, led 10 women of the royal family on Hajj in 1578, a journey that took three years and six months in total. Akbar's wife, Hindu by faith, owned her own transport ship called the Rahimi, a rather, rather large vessel capable of carrying 1,500 pilgrims to Mecca as well as cargo. Jahanara, the daughter of Emperor Shah Jahan, likewise owned her own ship and ordered that its maiden voyage would be reserved for transporting pilgrims to Mecca. She exempted the pilgrims from paying the fare, ordered that rice should be sent with the ship for distribution to Mecca's dervishes and the destitute, and the duties collected from merchants would be distributed in alms. Jahanara not only patronized Sufis, but like her brother Dada Shiko, was initiated into the Qadari Sufi order and wrote a biography of her teacher Mullah Shah and an another work on the Sufi Sheikh Muin al-Din Shisti, which survives in her own hand. She sponsored the building of a garden and mosque in Agra. 
and like other women of her family, commissioned numerous structures in her father's new capital of Shah Jahanabad. Mughal women of the court were not exceptional in this regard. A century before her, Mihrima Sultan, the daughter of the Ottoman Empress Suleiman, commissioned two mosques of her own in Istanbul, designed by the great architect Miamar Sinan. And she is hardly exceptional among Ottoman royal women, who commissioned not only mosques, but entire charitable complexes, incorporating mosques, convents, hospice kitchens, madrasas, elementary schools, hospitals, baths, and fountains. Several Safavid women commissioned madrasas, mosques, and bathhouses in Isfahan. Mamluk women built mausoleums and madrasas in Cairo. There is now a growing body of scholarship on female patronage of art and architecture that must not be ignored when addressing the role of women in Muslim societies and cultures, historical or contemporary. A coin, a prayer carpet, a mosque, a begging bowl, an astronomical text, and a portrait of a Mughal princess. Their value is clearly beyond the gold, the silk, brass, paper, and paint they are made of. The Mughal coin reminds us that Muslim rulers have come from diverse backgrounds, and that while they proclaim the oneness of God, some of their mothers perceived divinity in multitudinous forms. Distinct from the more homogeneous society in which Islam first emerged, the Islamic Mughal Empire comprised multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multi-confessional populations, where Christian and Hindu symbolism was utilized in Islamic artwork, where wine was consumed and the stars consulted. The Ottoman prayer carpet reminds us that the materials, techniques, colors, and designs of a single carpet used by Muslims in worship reflect the resources and contributions of different lands and peoples. This included Jews who cast out of a hostile Catholic Spain in the 15th century, found peace and prosperity and freedom in Muslim lands. Cairo's Mosque of Ibn Taloon reminds us that for centuries, Christians and Muslims worked together to design and build houses of prayer and that while Christian and Muslim architectural structures and styles may differ, like us, they reveal mutual influences and inspiration. The begging bowl, the kashkul, reminds us of the spiritual aspirations and values that Muslims and Christians share, along with adherents of other faith traditions, and that beyond our theological differences lays a transcendent unity such that we all stand poor and naked before our Creator. Al-Biruni's scholarship reminds us of the tremendous intellectual heritage of the Islamic world in virtually every field of knowledge, and how Muslims throughout the ages have not turned away from other cultures and religions, nor sought to destroy them, but rather turned to them with great interest and admiration to enhance and refine their own knowledge of the cosmos. Finally, the portrait of the Princess Jahanara reminds us that Muslim women have not been the silent, oppressed, powerless, passive, and uneducated victims as they are so often portrayed. They have been and continue to be individuals with considerable resources, intellectual, spiritual, political, and financial. In these ways, Islamic art historically and uniquely displays the diversity of Muslim lands, cultural, ethnic, gender, racial, and religious diversity, in stark contrast to contemporary attempts to homogenize, decontextualize, and dehistoricize Islam 
and the global community and destroy what is considered to be shirk, idolatry, or bidda, non-Muslim innovation. Rather than supporting the clash of civilizations perspective propagated by both Christian conservatives and Islamists, Islamic art reflects a historical, creative, and inventive intertwining of Muslims, Jews, Christians, Hindus, and others, partaking of a combined, common, and shared heritage of philosophy, theology, mathematics, chemistry, medicine, music, literature, manufacturing, cuisine, and more as well as art and architecture. While most of us may lack the financial resources to buy Islamic art, it is quite clear that unless we protect and preserve it, unless we study and teach it, we will be all the more poorer. Thank you. Pointed arches? Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is debated. Um, the, the first use of the pointed arch in Islamic lands comes from Iraq. Some people think that the origins are even further to the east and that perhaps Muslim architects got it further east. It's still debatable, but as far as the pointed arch in European architecture, that comes in with the Gothic period, it is clear that that comes from the Islamic Middle East. I either made myself very clear or I was completely confused. I think we're very clear. <laughs> When we watch the, the illustrations that you put on the presentation, we, we see a lot of um, geometrical figures and a lot of symmetry mm -hmm. um, in Islamic art. What could the reason behind that? Uh, that's a very good question. I think it's um, hard to um, hypothesize why Islamic cultures in general developed a very keen sense of symmetry and balance. I think perhaps it comes, it, it certainly derives from pre-Islamic cultures. So even in uh, pre-Christian periods, particularly in the Middle East, you had a love of geometry and a love of symmetry. Why Islam picks it up is simply because it's inheriting to some extent pre-existing artistic styles, but I think it also spoke to Islamic theology of a universe that was not chaotic, but was ordered. That is, the forces of nature and human history are ordered by God, the creator. So I think there might be a, um, a confluence there of pre-existing art, artistic and architectural styles that resonated once Islamic theology of the creation is developed. so that everyone else can hear you. Oh, I thought maybe I'm not in <laughs> um, You start to talk about the, um, like, when we start, it was like most of them were about like Iran, like lots of like, you know, you talked about like the, um, 
the prints and uh, most of the arts, like including like which originated from Iran. Is there any specific reason that most of the art does about Iran? Yeah, I think Iran um, plays an important role in Islamic culture and history uh, in a particular way. And that's because of its location, most of all. Because it serves as a nexus point for East and Western trade. So that what you have um, appearing in the various cultures in Iran, the, the Islamic cultures, is they're the ones first at, at the eastern edge of the quote unquote Islamic world to get influences from the Far East and then transfer those Far Eastern influences further west. So if you, like, if you noticed, for example, on that Christian plate, now that Christian plate is probably from Egypt or Syria, and yet it's got very Far Eastern elements in it. And so that is coming, means that those influences are coming from further east, and probably Iran serves as the nexus for those Eastern and Western influences to come together. Another question? Well, it seems like you have explained very well. We have one. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank very much to our mother, uh, I think we, ha we, ha we have one more. Uh, one more? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering if um, you found any, um, or um, in your research, you discussed any other art um, from the continent of Africa besides Egypt. Yeah, I, I am not a specialist, if you will, in African Islam, like Sub-Saharan African Islam, and so I really couldn't talk very much about the indigenous influences from Sub-Saharan Africa that affect Islamic art. I'm sure it exists. It's just that that's not my area, but it's a great question. But I would say, yes, of course there are influences, particularly most of these artistic influences move around because of trade. And of course, we know that Muslims were engaged in trans-Saharan commerce, particularly for luxury products like gold and ivory. So if you have commerce moving across the Sahara, you're going to have artistic influences as well. Thank you. Thanks. Final question? Let me give you another chance. Yes, final question. Uh, I do believe that art and architecture is valuable per se, but sometimes you know, functions are more valuable than the substance itself. So can you please, could you please elaborate a little more how art and architecture can function as a bridge for peace, for mm -hmm. world peace, in this chaotic world where there is Islamophobia mm -hmm. all around the world, actually? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I have an aesthetic appreciation for Islamic art, but as I continue to study Islamic art, I realize that beyond that importance, and this is really the primary point of my paper, is that Islamic art shows that Christians and Muslims and Jews and Hindus and other faith traditions and other cultures have for centuries been working, creating, studying, and learning from one another. But we in the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st century are being told a great lie. And the great lie is that Christians and Muslims and Jews and Hindus have been fighting one another for centuries, that they never derived anything but hardship and warfare from one another, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is the great lie of our contemporary world. Because we can say this, the Christian world would not be the Christian world of today were it not for the Muslim world and vice versa nor would Hinduism of the current age 
the Hinduism without the Muslim world and the Christian world, etc., etc. In other words, this idea that is propagated by religious conservatives, whether Christian or Muslim, that you have to extract from your culture and from your faith things that aren't Christian or things that aren't Islamic is a false notion. From the very beginning, the architectural expression of Christianity borrowed from pre-existing cultures and transformed them into something uniquely Christian. The Islamic world did the same thing. It drew inspiration and knowledge and expertise from the various cultures that it interacted with and didn't simply quote unquote copy them, it transformed them into something unique that we call Islamic art and architecture. That then flowed back into Christianity and to other cultures. So this idea that we can separate ourselves into pure Christians or pure Muslims or pure Jews is utterly false and impossible because we won't be then who we are today without those influences. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Father Michael Calabrian. Uh, and uh, please join me to again uh, really uh, thank him. Uh, and uh, we will have some refreshments outside. And uh, he will be there so you can have more conversation with him. Uh, so again, please, uh, again, thank him. Thank you very much.